Major Lindsay in Africa presents Between the Legal Lines, a podcast focused on leading women lawyers who have pushed beyond the boundaries and found success. Welcome to Between the Legal Lines. My name is Andrea Bricka, and I am your host today. Although today is a special episode, and we really have two hosts, as I am joined today by Eliza Stoker, my fellow host of Between the Legal Lines on MLA's Legal Talent Talk Network. This podcast is a series of monthly interviews where we explore how women, who happen to also be both executives and lawyers, navigate the boundaries placed upon them due to their roles and their demographic. These women have found success despite those sometimes very narrowly drawn lines that govern what is acceptable and what is not. And each month we hear a new story from a different woman about what that is like. As Major Lindsay in Africa's Executive Director for In-House Counsel Recruiting for the Eastern United States, Eliza is one of these women lawyers who is also an executive and has navigated these boundaries successfully. She was the inaugural host of this podcast, and is in this special episode, we want to share with you some of her thoughts and the things we have learned from our guests. Welcome, Eliza. So excited you're here today. Hi, Andrea. Thank you. That is a very warm welcome. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for starting this podcast. And first and foremost, tell the listeners about the genesis of Between the Legal Lines, including the name of the podcast. So I, I was actually approached by our marketing team asking whether I thought this was a good idea. Uh, and I had my own reasons for saying yes, that I'll go into in a moment, but you asked specifically about the title of it. There is kind of a funny story attached to that. Um, our marketing department full of people much better at marketing than myself did approach me with a name. They wanted to call it leading lady lawyers. I, I believe was the name they proposed and the alliteration, the cuteness, it's all there, right? It's memorable. It's a great name. So of course I insisted on changing it <laughs> because <laughs> I personally have issues with the word lady and its history. Uh, I think that is a word that is used to limit the behaviors that women are allowed to display. And when I say allowed to display, what I mean is display without judgment. And the word lady itself is a very critical part of that idea that women need to behave in a certain way in order to legitimately retain their status as women or ladies. So I did reject that excellent title. We went with Between the Legal Lines, kind of specifically in reaction to, to how I felt about the word lady. If the notion was how, why are we limiting the behavior of women and what happens if we stop limiting the behavior of women and maybe women are more successful when they shed those societal expectations of how their behavior should be limited. It was an idea I wanted to explore. And it was a very personal idea to me because I do think I can't help but be my authentic self, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate in any situation. And it has helped me succeed in business to a certain extent. And the reason why I say to a certain extent is because at some point you do have to learn the difference between when it's appropriate and when it's inappropriate. You do need to learn how to edit yourself in order to achieve executive success. But in general, when I defied expectations of how women were supposed to behave at work, I was more successful. And then when I started inter interviewing other successful lawyer executives, I, I felt like they were saying the same thing. Well, and that's definitely a theme we've seen, right? The authenticity. I mean, that's one of the themes that I've seen come across in the people I've interviewed. Did you have, and you had that same experience, I guess, when in, with the people that you interviewed, were there any in particular that stood out? Absolutely. A absolutely. Um, I met so many fabulous women through this project, all of whom were unabashedly their authentic selves and were proud of that and sometimes embarrassed by it. 
probably because of the notion of there being such a thing as ladylike behavior and unladylike behavior. But these women, I think almost all of them spent some time discussing how they just are themselves. And it shocks them how much that has helped them advance. I remember specifically Beata Para pointing to that. Uh, I remember Desiree Reese Morrison pointing to that. Uh, Michonne Michel Tillman spoke about that. I believe you interviewed her. Um, Latanya Langley, a very unique character. She read a poem in her interview. She described herself as a superhero. I mean, these are unique characters who are unafraid to show up at work as their true selves. And Desiree Reese Morrison, I do want to revisit her interview in a special way for a moment. Um, because like Latanya and Michonne, she is not just a woman, but she's a woman of color. And we spent some time talking about how that made her a quote unquote unicorn in the boardroom. And Desiree shared with me that while she does have an authentic work self that she always shares, she also then has a separate home self that she doesn't feel is the same as her authentic work self. And I have since learned since that interview that many women of color feel that way. And many men of color also feel like they have to have a different personality at work from their personality at home. So my struggle with this has been notably different from that of our colleagues of color, right? They still feel like they have to somewhat have two personalities, the one they show at work and the one they show at home. And that makes me very sad. And someone like Desiree and Michonne and Latanya, they've been successful because they have found a way to navigate that very tricky, nuanced difference. They're still their authentic selves at work. They just don't necessarily show every aspect of their personality because they don't yet feel like they're allowed to. That's interesting because I interviewed Beatrix Washington, who's the general counsel of OC Tanner in Utah, and she is a woman of color. And she talked about authenticity also, um, as you said, almost all these women did. And she said as she's grown in her career, she's felt a little more able to be authentic, which obviously acknowledges that early on she didn't feel that ability, right? And she mentioned even leaving work at four o'clock to attend, you know, a children's event and how she just thought that people would look at her differently if she did that, where she said men were going off to play golf or go to their kids' games, but I just internalized that they were going to look at me differently if I did that. And she, but she acknowledged over time it's developed. And I think that's been part of the theme too, is some of it comes with time, but part of what we want to accomplish is telling women don't wait, <laughs> be yourself. Um, Katie Lever mentioned that, you know, you have to be your, your authentic self, that that's what is going to allow you to succeed. She said, we do our best work when we're more authentic. And I think she even brought up what you wear. She said, if you're restricted in hose, which, you know, I mean, I used to joke that I didn't want to work in our New York office. I worked in our LA office because they had to wear pantyhose. I'm like, that's like the last thing I want to have to do every day. And Katie mentioned that. She's like, if you're, if you're constricted in what you're wearing, how can you be yourself? So if we have time, I could share with you my own pantyhose story from the New York office. Do we have time for that? I'm sure we have time for that. It's about being your authentic self. And we're so not picking on our New York office. I don't want people to think that, but it's, it's part of being who you are, right? It is definitely part of being who you are. It was 2011. I was hired by Major Lindsay Africa in April of that year. Um, things were getting warm in New York early that spring. And I showed up. It was my second week of work. And I showed up wearing a dress without pantyhose. It was warm out. And I didn't think twice about it. And my mentor was a woman named Lisa who... I adored and she did not pull any punches and she pulled me aside and said, go buy pantyhose. <laughs> and I was, I, I was shocked. I, I, I ran out the door. I went to a Dwayne Reed around the corner from the office and I bought a pair of like the worst, cheapest pantyhose that you can imagine. 
And my mentor was very satisfied with this. And I remember wearing pantyhose for the rest of that summer. I wore pantyhose all summer long every day. And it was a little ridiculous. And yet for me, it was a compromise. If I was going to speak up in the middle of a staff meeting and say, I disagree or <laughs> push back on a more senior colleague and say, here's a different way to accomplish that. If wearing pantyhose meant it was somehow more important than the content of my contributions, sure, I'll put the pantyhose on and continue to make my contributions. But that summer was absolutely the last summer I wore pantyhose. I, I do feel like I established myself in a way that allowed me to stop wearing pantyhose. <laughs> and I have never admonished a fellow female for not wearing pantyhose. I do believe that has gone the way of the dodo. I hope. I am knocking wood. I, I do hope. And I, as I said, LA, it wasn't a thing, but I knew it was in New York. And I think that ties into what you said about, right, lady. I mean, I, a lady would wear pantyhose, right? But a woman would be who she is in, in a sense. Um, so I think that that all ties together. But you also mentioned a mentor. And that was another theme I think we've seen. I mean, we ask about it, but everybody talked about it too, to some extent, about the importance of mentorship, women helping women. What did you hear from these conversations with these established general counsel and executives about that? All of them had mentees and mentors. I, I thought that was very notable. They were all able to point to men and women who had tapped them as someone with potential and encouraged them. And maybe even more important than the encouragement was the cheerleading that went on. A cheerleader is someone who sings your praises even when you're not in the room. And I, a number of women we interviewed pointed to the importance of that and frankly, the importance of having men be willing to do that for you. Um, and that may change over time. The importance of a male specific cheerleader may wane in the coming years. I, I don't have a crystal ball, but that does remain important. Um, most of the decision makers tend to be men. And if you've got one of them singing your praises, you need to you need to massage that relationship and learn as much as you can from that person. And then you need to repay the favor. Even though I'm in the middle of saying that having a male cheerleader can be very, very helpful, we as women, we do need to pay that forward to each other. And I believe all of the women, I don't remember a single one who was not trying to do that, trying to help a talented woman succeed. Yeah, I found that also. And I agree with you. It should change. I mean, it, it you you needed men to be your advocates because they were in positions of power. Um, I interviewed a couple you know, women in gaming and that was very much a male dominated space. And they had great male mentors that helped them, you know, in their career and rise in their career. And then I talked to Trevina Bird, who is the general counsel to American University and the higher education space. I mean, I think women were in some ways attracted to that. The sense I got from her is there were a lot of women helping women there because it was a space in which there were a lot of women. And I think that bodes well for the future and in, in the importance of that, I would think. I would think, I mean, if the statistics that we're seeing are true and I have no reason to believe they aren't, we are seeing an increasing number of women in positions of power. And so the power of their words and their actions are increasing with time also. There could very well come a day where it doesn't matter if it's a male or a female singing your praises. They are, your praises are heard with equal weight. Um, and that's part of what we mean when we talk about achieving critical mass in gender equality or race equality. You reach a tipping point, hopefully, we haven't gotten there yet, I don't think, in any 
measurable area of prejudice in modern society. I don't think anything has reached a tipping point yet, but we're getting closer. Where after that tipping point, people have trouble even remembering a time when you might have taken a white person's word more seriously or a man's word more seriously. And that's what we're all hoping to get to. Yes. And as we move forward, we're in the middle of this crises of the COVID and, you know, the, the, the race issues that have come up um, as, as we record this, obviously people were listening to this at different times, but we've learned a lot from, from this. I mean, is there anything that you have learned over the past couple months from everything going on, the work at home, the COVID you've mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the race issues, what have you learned as a leader and how has that changed your leadership? There's a lot. I have learned a lot. Um, and, and I don't, I'll be honest, I'm not even sure how to begin articulating some of what I learned. When we talked about Desiree Reese Morrison pointing out that she's a unicorn and that she is not only restricted by expectations of how women behave, she's also restricted by expectations of how Black people behave and how Black women behave. It's, it's, she's got a lot of lines between which she's supposed to be able to navigate, right? Um, and part of why I've been reflecting on her so much over these last few months is because one of the most important things I've learned is just a confirmation of what she was trying to explain to me, that that people of color do not yet feel like they can be themselves at work. And so in this remote environment, when we're all relying on video conferencing, to make an appearance on a video conference can be a very, very different thing for a white person as opposed to a person of color because they are being asked to put on that mask that many white executives don't have to wear and don't know that their colleagues of color are wearing. And so that lesson came very quick. It was almost immediately after George Floyd's murder that I had more than one person tell me, you need to make sure MLA does not require me to appear on video. And I had some very candid conversations with stakeholders at this company about that. And I felt like it was just a continuing opening of my eyes. It was the next step in that conversation I had had with Desiree, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also learned the importance of psychological safety at work. I think for many executives, that's an intuitive approach. If my team feels safe at work, if they feel like they can share opinions without reprisal, if they feel like they can behave in a way that's natural for them, they are likely to be more loyal and more productive. And I think that went from being something I was intuiting to an actual necessity of my role. Um, do I know if every single person on my team feels safe and secure? No. Can I try to help them feel like their workspace is a safe space? Yes, I can try to make that happen. And then if our relationship does become that safe space for them, their ties to our company become that much stronger. Their, the, the way they relate to their employment changes and it becomes one less anxiety inducing thing on their plate. We're all anxious over politics, over race relations, over the economy, over our physical health. Can we remove work as one of those long lists of anxieties, to some extent, I think, yes. And that's been a really big lesson for me during this pandemic. That attitude towards leadership and allowing people to do that ties in also to the authenticity we're talking about, right? I mean, I, I remember Michonne Tillman saying, look, as lawyers were advocates, as women, we tend to be advocates for other people. How are we advocates for ourselves? Is that us being authentic? Are we authentic, authentically advocates for ourselves as women, as you know, as 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 we've talked about, women of color have talked about. Um, as a manager, how do you instill that in people? Like you can come to work being your authentic self, 
you don't have to worry. Like what, how do you do that? It takes a long time and it takes a lot of energy. Um, and unfortunately I do suspect it's a level of energy that many leaders don't have time for. It's not even about inclination. It's about, do you have the time to spend even just half an hour talking to one person when you're managing 30 of them? Right. Um, and, and that is an unfortunate reality of the modern workplace that we're often encouraged to take on more work than is realistic for a single person. And when that happens, what falls by the wayside is that type of relationship building that yields safety and loyalty. How do you, as a manager, allow people to feel safe being their authentic self with all of this going on, allow them that, how, how, how do you, how do you allow people to find safety in their authenticity? I, I'll be honest. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I think it is about authenticity because that's what people react best to. If I'm pretending to be interested in their welfare and safety, then that's not very compelling, right? Um, if I'm probing into their personal life, that's not very fair, right? What I'm really talking about, about is do they feel safe at work? Um, and, and by limiting, like, yes, we form a friendly relationship and we'll occasionally talk about families and stuff, but frankly, out of respect for this notion of there being certain demographics who are discouraged from showing their authentic selves at work, I try to respect that experience by not delving too deeply into their personal lives and really just asking about how they're feeling at work. Are they being treated well by colleagues? Are their projects going well? Is there anything they need help with? Can I brainstorm some suggestions for a difficult project? Can I help them navigate a difficult conversation with a colleague or a client or a candidate? Um, being helpful in the real world situations that they're facing at work does tend to foster the kind of relationship that allows people to feel safe. If they're afraid to tell me a project is going sideways, I'm not going to be very helpful in uh, getting it back on track, right? Um, but when you talk about advocating for yourself, that's another area where I don't expect people to be able to do that. I always thought I was somewhat unique in that I could advocate for strangers or friends or loved ones, but I did not know how to advocate for myself. Then I realized most women in general feel that way, would describe themselves as a terrific advocate for everybody but themselves. And as a recruiter, I've heard men share that sentiment also. I can advocate for anybody but myself. I, I have heard this from all demographics. So I think that might just be a human thing unless you're kind of a jerk who goes around advocating for yourself all the time, right? Like I think most of us really struggle with that notion. So when I am talking to someone on my team, if I don't hear them advocating for themselves and their work, that doesn't actually mean anything to me because I don't expect them to be able to advocate for themselves. I, if I say, is this project going okay? And they say, no, I, that's a better answer than if they're like, it's going great, you know, no worries. Like, I, I don't even really want the advocacy for themselves. Does that make sense? It, it does. I think more and more people need to recognize that and in humans generally, um, and particularly, I think, in women and in lawyers, right? I mean, we're talking about lawyers and lawyers, by definition, are advocates and they're advocating on behalf of clients, right? I mean, what is the old saying? You you know, a, a lawyer that's a lawyer for themselves has a fool for a client. Like you want somebody to advocate on your, on your behalf. That's the entire profession. So I think we're in a situation where we need to recognize that. And I think as more and more people recognize that it's better across the board in companies and firms and, and, you know, in the, in the business world as a whole and in the world as a whole. Um, I, I guess I went off on a little bit of a tangent, but I think also one of the things when we talk about advocating is another topic that I 
want to touch on because it is a topic we touch on with a lot of these um, guests of ours, and that is the gender pay gap. And I know you've talked on this on other podcasts, um, have had articles about it, webinars about it. It's closing and that's a good thing, right? Where do we, where do you think we stand on that? It's closing, but it's not closed. Um, unconscious bias is all but impossible to fight in my experience. Um, the fact that it's unconscious means we don't know we're doing it. So it's very hard to say, wait a minute, I think I'm, I've got something unconscious happening here in my behavior. It's, it's not something the human brain is wired to recognize. That's why it's unconscious, right? Um, and I still believe that when you've got a man finalist and a woman finalist, if you were asking your client to develop compensation packages for both candidates, even though they're both finalists for the same position, I would bet dollars to donuts that the compensation plan they put together for the male finalists would be more robust. And it really is just about how we evaluate each other. We are all taught through experience, through media, even just people saying so, that men are leaders. And so when you've got a woman throwing her hat in the ring for a leadership position, she automatically has to overcome something that a man does not. And when you're giving someone that next level position that they've never had before, there is an unconscious drive to view the male candidate as readier than the female candidate. And so you're going to pay the male candidate more. Well, we're seeing improvement. So that's the good thing. We want to close out in the next minute or two on an up note. So what I want to do, we're going to celebrate. We're getting, we're getting out of We are going to celebrate and we have good reason to celebrate. And I'm, I am optimistic about the future. When I was in elementary school, the boys would say to the girls, oh, but you can't run or play sports because you're girls. I, I don't think, is that still being said in playgrounds around the country? I, I kind of think not. Um, even like five years ago, if I said to my boss, who is a man and who I respect very much and I've learned a lot from, if I were to say to him five years ago, okay, what's happening to me in this situation feels like gender bias. I would have gotten a little bit of a lecture on why it wasn't gender bias and why I shouldn't be making such an accusation. If I said that to him today, he would be like, oh no, tell me more. Let's talk about it. Uh, what can I do differently? A, a lot has changed and it's the positive power of humankind. We have a lot of evidence of how horrible humans can be, especially lately, but humans can also be wonderful and they have capacity for genuine caring about each other. Um, have you ever read a story about a stranger who suffered a tragedy and you feel yourself crying even though you don't know that person? That's a very human quality. And the more energy we devote to focusing on what's wonderful about people, the more successful we will be at making positive change in the world. And if we can remain optimists for the next, I don't know, 10 years, we might be shocked at what kind of equality we accomplish because we're already starting down that path. So much has changed for the better, but we do need to keep going and we can't leave our colleagues of color behind. It has to be a unified march towards equality for all people and not just specific groups. Very, very wise. I, don't, I can't add anything more to that. Uh, is there anything more you would want to add as far as what you've learned in talking to these women, listening to th these podcasts that you don't think we've talked about here today? I, we did talk about it, but I do want to, I, I want to circle back to where we started and turn it into advice for anyone who might be listening. Um, if we are right that authenticity helps women be more successful in the workplace, we should also spend a moment recognizing 
that some women have been so indoctrinated into this notion of this is how women behave. And if you step outside these lines, you're no longer a valid woman. Some women don't know who their authentic selves are. And that's very sad to me. Some women can't take that advice because they don't know how yet. And for those women, I want to say it's okay. Continue discovering who you are. Stop letting movies and television and other people tell you who you are. Discover who you are and then feel free to be a little bit weird or a little bit straight laced or whatever it is it turns out you actually are. Take the time to make that discovery and it will pay off, not just at work, but in your personal life, in all aspects of your life. Well, Eliza, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here today. This has been just a wonderful conversation. I hope we can do it again sometime. This has been Between the Legal Lines on the Legal Talent Talk Network. We are so glad you joined us today. I am Andrea Bricka, along with Eliza Stoker from Major Lindsay in Africa. Join us in the coming months as we speak with more women lawyers who share their stories of navigating successfully between the legal lines. Discover how Major Lindsay in Africa can help you navigate the legal landscape at www.mlaglobal.com.